Happy New Year. I hope your 2020 is starting off with a bang. Thank you for listening to Author Stories through 2019 and all of the previous years. We had an amazing year last year and looking forward to doing bigger and better things this year. Before we get into the interview, we're going to thank a couple of sponsors who make the show possible. Please uh, give them a shout out and uh, look them up on Amazon and make sure that uh, you tell them that you appreciate their sponsorship of Author Stories. At the end of the show, we're going to have an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. This audio clip is narrated by the one and only Luke Daniels. You're going to love this series. I love it so much. And uh, Richard has been a great supporter and sponsor of the show. And we're going to show him some love. Listen to the audiobook excerpt. You're going to love it. And uh, be sure to go to audible.com to purchase it. If you're not an Audible subscriber, you can get a free book just by signing up for a free trial at audibletrial.com slash Hank. You get a 30-day free trial. You get the free book. If you decide to cancel your Audible subscription, you get to keep the free book. And it doesn't cost you a single penny. Audibletrial.com slash Hank. And uh, listen after the show for the clip from Richard Fox. We're so happy to have our friend Crystal Pico Watanabe as a sponsor of the show. Crystal is one of the best editors in the business. And she has just debuted a new service that I think you'll absolutely love. And will help you to up your writing game. Pico School of Wordcraft and Editing has just debuted and the first course is called Properly Punctuating Dialogue. It's a mini course and can be completed in just about 20 minutes. It covers the basics of dialogue punctuation. Authors can get access to the new school and the course for free by signing up for Crystal's author newsletter, Notes from Pico. Go to picoshouse.com slash newsletters. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com slash newsletters more in-depth courses will be added in 2020 make sure you don't miss a thing picoshouse.com slash newsletters writers i have an amazing tool to tell you about a revolutionary writing tool for planning stories campfire pro is what novelists need to go from the seed of an idea to a detailed plan that's ready to be executed complete your character design create a timeline, and track your world building all in one place with our downloadable desktop app for Mac and PC. Without the annoying subscription model so many apps are using today. Visit CampfireTechnology.com for special holiday pricing on Campfire Pro today. Who wants to love a billionaire? Billionaires in New York, book one by Laura Burton. Julie does not love being the center of attention. She makes dresses for those who do. But when Emily, her matchmaking friend, begs for a favor, Julie can't say no. It was supposed to be just one date. She never expected to kiss the guy, then fall head over heels for him. When threats start rolling in, it becomes clear someone will do whatever it takes to break them apart. Now she's in too deep and walking away isn't an option. But with the paparazzi and drama involved, Julie cannot help but wonder, who wants to love a billionaire? Hollywood producer Harry Jackson is not an alpha male. He's goofy, sensitive, and will move mountains to make everyone happy. In fact, he requires a whole team of people to keep him from being robbed blind. Sometimes he even needs saving from his love of bad puns. But when an enemy threatens to jeopardize his chance at love, it's time to step up and fight. He's terrified, but the thought of losing Julie scares him more. Pick up Who Wants to Love a Billionaire? The Billionaires in New York, Book One by Laura Burton. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Chad Dundas on the show with me today. He has an amazing new book. It's called The Blaze, and uh, today's release day for the book, isn't it? It is, yeah. It's exciting yeah, to yeah. Uh, get it out there in the world. Absolutely. Congratulations on that. And uh, I know we're going to have a great chat today. Uh, Chad, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, wow. That's a great question. You know, I was lucky enough to grow up kind of in a family full of writers. Uh, my grandma was the 
head librarian in the school district in the town where we lived in Montana. So she was constantly plying all of her grandkids with books and, uh, you know, encouraging us to, to be storytellers and, and write stories. Uh, my uncle was a career sports writer at the, at the newspaper here. Um, one of my aunts was the director of creative writing at the, uh, at the university here. And so it was a great privilege for me to grow up now uh, with writing kind of in my life, but also to see all these people around me who were making careers out of, out of writing. And just that representation, I think made it, made it seem possible. I would say though, that the biggest influence on me growing up though, was probably my older brother. Uh, he's three years older than I am. And, and now as an adult, he was a long time magazine editor and has two nonfiction books out. And as a kid, I just kind of followed him around and wanted to do all of the things that, that he did. And he was into mysteries and thrillers pretty early on and, and kind of got me hooked on Sherlock Holmes and all of the, the uh, regular mysteries, I guess you would say that the kids read to kind of get excited about that, about that genre. Uh, you know, I, in, in high school, I ultimately followed him into the, the journalism program and became, became a journalist. So that's my brother, Zach. He's, he's always been a huge influence on me and is probably the person who more than, than, anything else like made me want to be a writer uh, just so I could be like my big brother. I love that. Literally surrounded by storytellers. That's, uh, that's a fantastic story. Um, you said that your, your brother challenged you to sort of walk in his footsteps. Um, what was it about journalism uh, that excited you in the beginning? Uh, you know, early on, I think it was because I saw my brother doing it. I saw his friends kind of doing it and, I was also lucky enough to go to this uh, high school in Missoula, Montana, in our hometown, where uh, the journalism program was pretty well regarded, and the uh, the journalism uh, the director there was this this guy who the, the all of the students really liked to take classes from. His name was Wayne Seitz, and he was, you know, in in many ways, sort of like cliched vision of the crusty old journalist who uh, liked to take kids under his wing, and but had a kind of very gruff manner. Uh, and uh, would would teach you the ropes of journalism uh, with a lot of tough love <laughs> and a lot of uh, a lot of letting you learn by experience. Having people go out there and, and you know do journalism in the school and and write stories that would ultimately come out in the student newspaper, make their own mistakes, uh, let let them figure figure out what what the best practices were, what to do, what not to do, and of course always be there to. Uh, pro provide some instruction. And so, uh, you know, he, Wayne was another guy who, as a, a, a teacher of mine early on, was a big influence uh, on me and uh, pointed me in the direction of, of journalism, you know, for whatever reason. I think my personality just attached to the the direct writing style, the kind of economy of language, the narrative speed, all of that stuff that is is so essential to journalism. And of course, uh, once I graduated and, and was bound for the for the University of Montana, there it also had a terrific journalism program. You know, was, we were a top 20 national student newspaper during the years that I was there, always kind of slugging it out with other uh, nationwide student newspapers that had bigger staffs and bigger budgets. We sort of viewed ourselves as these scrappy underdogs from an out of the way place trying to do good work. And so all that stuff, I think, got got me really excited about the craft and ultimately like put me on the on the path to to do that as well as fiction. I've uh, I've known a lot of writers, Chad, who um, who cut their teeth in journalism and then went on to write fiction. Um, a lot of uh, journalists that I know have gone on to write crime fiction and thrillers. Um, and, and I, I love to ask them, you know, what things they picked up from journalism that helped them as that kind of writer. Um, you did a lot of journalism, uh, in sports journalism, uh, which is, which is a unique niche for someone who's writing thrillers now. Um, what do you feel like that you picked up, uh, from working in sports specifically that helps you as a fiction writer now? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say a lot, frankly, um, you know, the, the things that I mentioned earlier, just about economy of language, narrative speed, uh, trying to write a, a, a propulsive account that, that sucks three years in and carries them through while at the same time, you know, dispensing all of this information that you have to dispense in a fairly short amount of time. Uh, and one of the things about sports writing is that you are writing 
accounts uh, where almost everyone who read it is is going to know the outcome <laughs> of the uh, of the event before they read it. So you were able to bring in a little bit more creativity, I think, than you are maybe in just standard news writing. You were able to be a little bit more glib where it's appropriate here and there, and you're able to have a little bit more fun with with the language, um, even though you are still tasked with uh, making a creating a very functional document, making it so that, that, that people get the information that they need to get about, uh, you know, whatever sporting event it is that you were writing about. And so I feel like a lot of that stuff informs my fiction. You know, just naturally, I, I think I have a pretty economical, uh, direct writing style that that probably is informed as much by journalism as by anything that I ever learned in, in a creative writing class. And you know, above and beyond that, I would say a couple of things about journalism in general and sports writing specifically, in that in sports writing, you are often turning around copy on a very, very tight deadline, especially if you are covering event an event live somewhere. You know, that event might end at 10 o'clock and you have to get your story written and filed to your editor before the paper goes to the press at 11. So you essentially have an hour or 45 minutes to uh, crank out as much as you can with the knowledge that uh, whether you like it or not, it's going to come out in the newspaper the next day. So you don't really have time to obsess over a turn of phrase here or a clever sentence there. And, uh, you know, while there's great pressure in that, I think, trying to, to write those stories uh, on deadline, I think there's also a certain freedom to it. It gets you accustomed to working through writer's block. It gets you accustomed to writing through difficult scenes. It gets you accustomed to uh, getting stuff down on the page, even when your internal editor might tell you that it's not the greatest thing in the world, uh, all of which kind of comes in handy for fiction writing, uh, just working through the process that every writer goes through when, when you're writing something you know, as in depth as a book. And the the other thing that I would just say about journalism is that I also think it gets you accustomed to working with an editor. You uh, you are used to seeing your your words changed here and there. You're used to taking advice and direction from an editor, and you are are used to the process of ultimately trusting those people to make the the product the best that it can be. And when then, of course, when you get into fiction, you, there's a lot of editing that goes on um, from various sources. And so I think oh yeah. Uh, ab- above and beyond anything else, journalism kind of gets you prepared for that process. I would like to say that it makes me an easy person to edit. I don't know. You would have probably have to ask my editors <laughs> if, uh, if that's actually the case. I, I never thought about the, uh, the aspect that, that you mentioned uh, earlier uh, about when you're writing sports, most everyone knows the outcome already. Um, I, don't, I don't guess I've ever really pondered that. Uh, but yeah, that, that would make you look at story in a completely different way. Wouldn't it? That, uh, uh, the, the, um, the, the tricks that a lot of writers use, um, you've kind of seen that before and, and have already learned ways to, to maybe think outside the box. Yeah. In, in some ways it definitely does. You know, uh, like I said, depending on what your assignment is, you're certainly charged with creating a functional document. So you have to get the who, what, when, where, how, and why in there also. But I think, you know, as a sports writer, it encourages you to, maybe look inside the the mechanism, so to speak, to look at the, the you know, the details or the statistics of, of the actual game and bring out maybe some narratives that, that aren't apparent to just the casual viewer. I think, you know, if you, if, if you are a really, really good sports writer, you possess this, those skills as a writer, but also the knowledge of, of the game or the event that you are covering that you're able to, to look inside the bigger picture and kind of tell people how and why, things turned out the, the way that they did. And so, uh, you know, that kind of detail oriented approach, I think the sort of uh, the things that you're able to do in sports writing with, with the craft that are a little bit different than the news writing all, all come in handy. And I think all that stuff really does uh, inform my fiction and kind of has had a huge impact on the, the way that I write overall. Yeah. So your first novel that you published is called champion of the world. What, uh, what was it that, um, that turns you to uh, to writing fiction, to writing prose? Uh, I think it had always been a huge interest of mine. Uh, you know, I had uh, those members of my family that I talked about earlier that uh, were always supportive of that, and some of them were doing it themselves. Some of them were, were sort of modeling it as a, a potential profession right in front of me. So I always knew that it was possible. And then once I got into uh, an academic setting, it, it, like I always felt I had a sort of natural ability for it. 
uh, I always felt like I was kind of kind of good at it, and uh, this is something that I was interested in. I was I was interested in uh, in writing books to see that finished product with your with your name on it and the dust jacket and the you know hardcover copy of your book. There's almost no feeling like it in terms of of being a writer. So I think I was attracted to to all of that stuff. And then, you know, on top of everything else, it turned out I couldn't really do math and I couldn't do science. So uh, I was, I was, had one path and I decided I was going to walk. Well, that first book took place uh, in 1921 and dealt with a disgraced uh, former, uh, you know, champion fighter. Uh, What what was it that, that made the story come alive to you? Well, champion of the world was kind of a unique obsession of mine and no one, but was more surprised than me that uh, it was historical fiction. And that was, that was what I wrote for my debut book. It was kind of a, a departure for me in a way, but I had been a lifelong uh, professional wrestling fan as a kid. And then as I grew up, I became more interested in the, the history of wrestling, which is very strange and arcane and in many ways kept by con men. So <laughs> above and beyond everything else, it's, you can't really depend on it. You're not really sure uh, what's true and what isn't. And so as an adult, that became a concept that was really intriguing to me, uh, especially as a writer, that you are able to to take this performance that is professional wrestling, but it, it's also a performance that masquerades as, as something legitimate. And so it, it naturally bends the, um, the line between uh, fiction and reality. And, and, you know, even the people involved in it sometimes can't tell what's real and what's fake. And so that was something that really, uh, drew me in. And I think also having grown up as a sports writer and have, have gotten into this niche uh, over the last decade or so where I'm a, a, a combat sports writer primarily, writing about boxing and mixed martial arts, I think a lot of the, the people who are mixed martial arts fighters in 2019, 2020 are analogous to the very tough, hard-nosed uh, people who would have been professional wrestlers at the turn of the century. You know, they were there back when the sport was a legitimate athletic contest. Some of the toughest people around would be professional wrestlers and they would be these, you know, very highly trained, highly skilled, uh, uh, rough and tumble guys. And then as we, as you move forward in, in the, in that century, as the sort of modern sports, uh, philosophy started to take hold, and professional wrestling promoters decided that they were going to change it from a, a legitimate contest to something that was scripted. You had these guys that had to make these big changes in their lives. They were, you know, the thing that they had had prided themselves all along was kind of being tough and being uh, able to, to wrestle with anybody. And then it turned out that what they really needed to do was be a, a performer, like a, a star of the stage or a vaudeville performer. And that, that transition couldn't have been easy for some of those guys who really prided themselves on their, on their toughness. So all that stuff uh, was intriguing to me and also kind of uh, found a voice in my, in my career as a sports writer. And I was able to, to uh, take some of those influences and weave them all together to make uh, champion of the world. After uh, after Champion of the World and, and going through that whole process of, you know, nothing to finish novel and and then, you know, finding an agent, finding a publisher, getting that out into the world, um, you know, that's a that's a momentous occasion for for so many people, um, and especially someone who's, you know, been around story and storytellers all their lives. Um, you followed that book up with your new book called The Blaze, uh, which is a, a modern thriller. Uh, and I know you talked about your brother and what an influence he was and, um, you know, reading those, uh, you know, reading the kinds of books that he did and, 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 you know, that he was really into thrillers. Um, what was it that, that got this story going for you? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I always knew that I was going to turn to, uh, something more contemporary and, and turn to the mystery genre once I got champion of the world done. Uh, and I had been thinking, for a long time, I think about uh, writing about a character who was suffering from some manner of, of profound memory loss and the possibilities that that would suggest, especially in uh, the mystery genre, just, uh, you know, as a natural function of, of this person lacking any real uh, uh, way to orient themselves in, in their adult life. And they, you know, not really remembering their past. It just seemed to present a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, possibility for, for that genre. And so that was a a kind of character that I've been thinking a lot about. Um, Unfortunately in my day job as a sports writer covering MMA, I end up writing more than I, than I ever would want to about brain injuries. And, 
have been forced to contemplate how how brain injury affects people and how when the function when the physical structures of the brain are damaged how that can uh affect personality and affect behavior and affect memory and so i uh unfortunately I had to kind of develop this very shallow layman's knowledge of brain injuries and i'm sort of like, I mean, an expert but I, I you know i've interviewed a lot of, of brain uh, researchers and brain doctors and, and things like that. So I felt like I had a, a, a realistic and, and decent background in that subject matter. And then to read news reports about soldiers coming home from the war with what is being described as the signature wound of, of modern warfare and the traumatic brain injury, uh, I think all those uh, kind of narrative threads and ideas came together in my mind and ultimately like became the blaze. Tell me about the character of Matthew Rose. Um, you've you've alluded to him uh, a little bit, and uh, in, an Army veteran, um, a really complex character. He's an Army veteran who was raised uh, by hippie activist parents. Um, you know, so how does he even become this person? Uh, he finds himself back home with this traumatic brain injury, um, with uh, with a memory that's not quite intact. Um, how did Matthew come to you and, uh, and and tell us a little bit about your process of discovering him as a character? Uh, yeah, I think he was a guy that I'd kind of been uh, thinking about writing about for a while just because of uh, the memory loss aspect and the, um, the uh, brain injury aspect. And uh, I knew that I wanted to set the book in my hometown of, of Missoula, so I wanted to craft Matthew and, and frankly, uh, the other point of view character in the novel, George Porter, as characters who were a lot like the people in my own life, kids that I had grown up around in, in Montana, and, and to a certain extent, people that had similar experiences to me uh, as an adult. Um, and, and so Matthew kind of began to take shape that way. Uh, you know, I've, I've had some friends who served in the military, even though I never. Uh, served myself, and so it turned to them in many ways to uh, inform his character and tell me what what seemed uh, natural and seemed believable and, and what didn't. And and so the process with him was uh, somewhat involved and somewhat uh, rewarding at the same time. I think when I started in with writing about him, I was a little bit naive as to what the process would be to write about a character that had such profound memory loss. Uh, you, you know come to find out that <laughs> as human beings, we are essentially uh, the sum total of our previous experience and our memories and, you know, the, the experiences that we've had, many of our likes and dislikes, wants and desires are all sort of shaped uh, by our, our previous experience. And so to write about a character who doesn't retain any of those experiences is uh, it's limiting in some ways. And I think it's, it's exciting in other ways. And, you know, just from a craft standpoint, it really kind of narrows the window of what you're able to do with that character, what he's able to express, because he's experiencing life very much moment to moment. He knows that he has this this hole in his past and he's trying to, you know, find the spark that's going to illuminate these memories that that he's lost. So he, he is in many ways desperate. He is in many ways it's experiencing his hometown through new eyes and as a stranger. And he's encountering all of these people who have uh, experience with him. They, they have previous memories that he does not retain. And so he's automatically put in this position of, of trying to play catch up, of trying to figure out who he can trust and who he, who he can't trust uh, and who is kind of leading him down these false paths. And so all of that stuff makes him the, the ideal character in my mind to put the center of, of a mystery because, you know, just as he is figuring out himself, the, the reader is learning about him and learning about the story. So it, it creates this, uh, parallel that that is interesting to me, and I hope is interesting to to the reader, where you are sort of learning about Matthew while Matthew is learning about himself and and learning about the truth of of his past, and also trying to you know, solve this this ongoing mystery. So I hope all of that stuff comes together and and comes out in the novel and makes it uh, both a unique and and enjoyable experience for the reader. Matthew literally has a spark that uh, that triggers. Uh, these memories and the um, uh, brings back recollections of things in the past that, that start to, to haunt him as he sees a house on fire that then, um, you know, brings him back uh, to, to a place that he's forgotten. Um, you know, every great mystery book has to, has to have a puzzle to solve, um, so to speak. Uh, when writing the blaze, um, how did the, the idea for, 
for the mystery come about? Um, did it come from discovering who Matthew Rose is and then, um, you know, figuring out what made him who he is? Or did you have an idea for uh, kind of the, the plot device of the mystery, the puzzle to be solved? And then Matthew came around that. Yeah, I think a little of both. I think the character of Matthew probably came first because he had been a person that I was trying to work out in my own mind and a kind of character that I'd been toying with with writing about for a long time. And then uh, the the plot and the mechanisms of the plot were kind of born out of a couple of actual fires that occurred in, in Missoula, Montana when I was growing up, although the, the, the versions of those events that appear in the book are, are highly fictionalized. Uh, but when I was a kid, uh, the candy store in our neighborhood really did burn down, which is one of the uh, events in this novel, the, the, a fire from uh, Matthew's childhood that he ultimately remembers and becomes the key to sort of unlocking uh, his, his own past. And so that, you know, uh, it, it, I had to f- fictionalize it a lot to kind of to, to make it fit into this murder mystery. But at the same time, you can imagine as a kid that the candy store burns down. That's a, a momentous uh, right. occasion. And so it was one of the things that kind of always stuck in my brain. And, and uh, ultimately, I w- worked into this book. And then that there was another uh, fire where a couple of university employees had their house burned down when I was working for the student newspaper at the University of Montana. And that kind of uh, ultimately took the shape of this present day fire that, that happens in the blaze, which is one of the in- inciting incidents in the book and the thing Matthew encounters on his very first meet back in town. Um, so it was it was kind of mi- a mixture of both, of having this character that I kind of wanted to figure out a mystery that I wanted to weave him into, and then having these previous experiences in, in my life that I thought uh, were interesting and would make good fodder for a mystery. And then those two things, uh, you know, in, in the end, kind of wrapping themselves together and becoming one c- cohesive book. How did the, the process, um, Chad, uh, of writing Champion of the World and the blaze, because these are two very different books. Um, what was the, the writing process, uh, on these two? How, how different was it? And with the blaze being, uh, you know, a mystery thriller, um, you know, was there more planning that had to go in on the, on the front end of writing this book? Uh, yeah, the, the writing processes were very different. And, and like with champion in the world, a big psychological hurdle that I had to get over was just convincing myself that I could write a book. I'd never done it before, you know, as a, uh, a graduate student at the university, I had written a, a, a partial novel for my senior thesis and it had kind of, you know, I got it done to the point where they would let me graduate, but I never really finished it as, as a book. And it became this sort of uh, albatross where I rewrote and rewrote and rewrote so many times that uh, I kind of worked all the magic out of it. And ultimately it just didn't really go anywhere. And I ended up, ended up throwing, throwing it in the drawer. So uh, the, the champion of the world, I just needed to convince myself that I could write a book. So, so the process was that I sat down and I wrote the first draft all the way through without ever going back to reread or edit any of the things that I had already written, uh, which, which worked. I got, I got a first draft done. It was a mess. It was uh, full of errors and, and uh, you know, narrative problems and things like that. But like I had a, a terrible product that I could then take and, and make better. And so I managed to clear that psychological hurdle. I had this giant stack of, of papers that I could look at and say, okay, I can do this. Now I just need to go back and, and make this, uh, you know, publishable. And so the, the writing process of champion of the world was, was, uh, a, a, a lot involving that and, and frankly written from a place of, of anonymous, uh, uh, certainty, like anonymous uh, comfort. I had this idea that like, if I tried to write this weird book about pro wrestling and it didn't work, nobody would ever know about it except for myself and like a couple of close friends and readers uh, who were helping me edit the very early drafts of it. So that was, you know, I had to get over this hurdle of, of actually writing the book, but there was some comfort there knowing that if I failed, no one would know. The Blaze was, was much different because uh, I had already sold it to the publisher. And at least in my own mind, you know, there were there were people at the publishing company who were waiting for it. People knew that it was, it was coming. And so if it failed, like it was going to be a much, a much bigger deal, both uh, for other people and just in terms of my career. So th- there was some psychological uh, hurdles to get over obstacles to clear in writing the blaze a, a, as well. And so that, that informed the, the writing process of, of the blaze probably more than anything else. And, you know, above and beyond that, as you mentioned, I was kind of uh, getting into wrestling with these 
uh, issues that I think all mystery writers probably probably have to grapple with. But for me, it was the first time just in terms of like plotting and, you know, figuring out uh, the narrative arc and the, like where rising action was going to occur. There's going to be these peaks of, of like thrilling experiences and then you're, you're going to have some falling action. Kind of like plotting that out. So it would work over the course of a novel, figuring out how the mystery itself was going to function inside the narrative. So figuring out clues and like how to space it out in the book and so all that stuff uh uh, was was a process for me and figuring out how to do it and and in the end i like i'm happy with the product and and it was you know i learned a lot doing it and i think it'll help me moving forward uh as i do my my next books but but yeah it was definitely uh there was a learning curve with the blaze for sure well the new book is called the blaze it's available everywhere now in hardcover audiobook and Kindle edition. Uh, Chad, I love the book so much, and uh, I love what you're doing. If if people are just learning about you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, is there a place where they can connect with you online? Of course, yeah. Uh, People can go to my website, which is chaddundas.com, where they can find out about the fiction. Uh, I'm on Twitter, at Chad Dundas. Uh, You can follow a lot of my sports writing from there. Uh, Also on Facebook. Chad, um, we're going to send everyone to see you and to pick up a copy of The Blaze. Uh, Thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thanks, Hank. Stay tuned now for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Fox's The Ember War. The Near Future Humanity's only hope of survival entered the solar system at nearly the speed of light. The probe slowed as the sun's heliosphere disrupted the graviton wave it rode in on from the abyss of deep space. Awakened by the sudden deceleration, the probe absorbed the electromagnetic spectrum utilized by its target species and assessed the technological sophistication of the sole sentient species on Earth. The probe adjusted its course to take it into the system's primary. If the humans couldn't survive, with its help, what was to come, then the probe would annihilate itself. There would be no trace of it for the enemy, and no chance of humanity's existence beyond the time it had until the enemy arrived. The probe analyzed filed patents, military expenditures, birth rates, mathematical advancement, and space exploration. The first assessment fell within the margin of error of survival and extinction for humanity. The probe's programming allowed for limited, autonomous decision-making, choice being a rare luxury for the probe's class of artificial intelligence. The probe found itself in a position to choose between ending its mission in the sun's fire and a mathematically improbable defense of humanity, and the potential compromise of its much larger mission. Given the rare opportunity to make its own decision, the probe opted to dither. In the week it took to pass into Jupiter's orbit, the probe took in more data. It scoured the Internet for factors to add to the assessment, but the assessment remained the same. Unlikely, but possible. By the time it shot past Mars, the probe still hadn't made a decision. As the time to adjust course for Earth or continue into the sun approached, the probe conducted a final scan of cloud storage servers for any new information and found something interesting. While the new information made only a negligible impact on the assessment, the probe adjusted course to Earth. It hadn't traveled all this way for nothing. In the desert south of Phoenix, Arizona, it landed with no more fanfare than a slight thump and a few startled cows. Then it broke into the local cell network and made a call. Mark Ibarra awoke to his phone ringing at max volume, playing a pop ditty that he hated with vehemence. He rolled off the mattress that lay on the floor and crawled on his hands and knees to where his cell was recharging. His roommate, who paid the majority of their rent and got to sleep on an actual bed, grumbled and let off a slew of slurred insults. 
Mark reached his cell and slapped at it until the offending music ended. He blinked sleep from his eyes and tried to focus on the caller's name on the screen. The only people who'd call at this ungodly hour were his family in Bosque country, or maybe Jessica in his applied robotics course wanted a late-night study break. The name on the screen was Answer Me. He closed an eye and reread the name. It was way too early, or too late, depending on one's point of view, for this nonsense. He turned the ringer off and went back to bed. Sleep was about to claim him when the phone rang again, just as loudly as last time, but now with a disco anthem. Seriously? His roommate slurred. Mark declined the call and powered the phone off. He flopped back on his bed and curled into his blanket. To hell with my first class, he thought. Arizona State University had a lax attendance policy, one which he'd abused for nights like this. The cell erupted with big band music. Mark took his head out from beneath the covers and looked at his phone like it was a thing possessed. The phone vibrated so hard that it practically danced a jig on the floor, and the screen flashed Answer Me over and over again as music blared. Dude, said his roommate, now sitting up in his bed. Mark swiped the phone off the charging cord, and the music stopped. The caller's name undulated with a rainbow of colors, and an arrow appeared on the screen, pointing to the button he had to press to answer the call. When did I get this app? He thought. Mark sighed and left the bedroom, meandering into the hallway bathroom with the grace of a zombie. The battered mattress he slept on played hell with his back and left him stiff every morning. Dropping his boxers, he took a seat on the toilet and answered the call, determined to return this caller's civility with some interesting background noise. What? he murmured. Mark Ibarra, I need to see you. The voice was mechanical, asexual in its monotone. Do you have any friggin' idea what time it is? Wait, who the hell is this? You must come to me immediately. We must discuss the mathematical proof you have stored in document title This Can't Be Right dot doc. Mark shot to his feet. The boxers around his ankles tripped him up, and he stumbled out of the bathroom and fell against the wall. His elbow punched a hole in the drywall, and the cell clattered to the floor. He scooped the phone back up and struggled to breathe as a sudden asthma attack came over him. <laughs> How? How? He couldn't finish his question until he found his inhaler in the kitchen mere steps away in the tiny apartment. He took a deep breath from the inhaler and felt the tightness leave his lungs. That someone knew of his proof was impossible. He'd finished it earlier that night, and had encrypted it several times before loading it into a cloud file that shouldn't have been linked to him in any way. How do you know about that? he asked. You must come to me immediately. There is little time. Look at your screen the robotic voice said. His screen changed to a map program, displaying a pin in an open field just off the highway, connecting Phoenix to the suburb of Maricopa. Come. Now. Mark grabbed his keys. An hour later, his jeans ripped from scaling a barbed wire fence, Mark was surrounded by desert scrub. The blue of the morning rose behind him, where his beat-up Honda waited on the side of the highway. With his cell to his ear, Mark stopped and looked around before deciding how to continue. Spiked ocotillo plants looked a lot like benign mesquite trees in the darkness. A Native American casino in the distance served as his north star, helping him keep his bearings. You're not out here, are you? I'm being punked, aren't I? He asked the mysterious caller. You are 9.26 meters to my east-southeast, 
punk, decayed wood, used as tinder. Are you on fire? The caller said. Mark rolled his eyes. This wasn't the first time the caller had used the non-standard meanings of words during what passed as conversation between the two. Mark had tried to get the caller to explain how he knew about his theorem and why they had to meet in the middle of the desert. The caller had refused to say anything. He would only reiterate that Mark had to come quickly to see him, chiding him every time Mark deviated from the provided driving directions. If you're so close, why can't I see you? He asked. He took a few steps in what he thought was a northwesterly direction and squished into a cow patty.